Today we will be talking about how to benchmark your code. This is an essential process that you need to undertake whenever you're trying to optimize your code, because you need to know how a code performs before and after any changes that you've made. Let's jump straight into Visual Studio Code and look at an example. Now we're in Visual Studio Code, let's open up a new file so we can start writing some Julia code. If you go over to the File Explorer and click this New File button, we can create a file which, for now, I'll just call main.jl. Once we've created a new file, I'll just close the Explorer by clicking this button on the left. Now that we have a file open, we also want an open REPL so that we can interactively explore our code. To search for a command in Visual Studio Code, you use the controls Control shift p to bring up the command palette. On Max, this will be Command shift p And you want to type in Start REPL. If you don't see this option, you probably don't have the Julia extension installed, and you'll have to go back to one of the previous videos to learn how to set up all of your software. So once you click on this command, a REPL should open in the terminal section of VS Code. What I'm going to do is just put this on the right hand side so it'll be easier to see our code and the REPL itself. So I'm just going to right click, go to panel position, and click right. So now that we have our open REPL, let's see how we can time some code in Julia. And for that, we'll need an example. So here I've just written a quick function that adds two input arrays as if they're vectors and just does so element-wise and puts it in a new array C. I've used this command similar, which if you hover over it, the documentation will say this creates an array that is similar to the input array. So it has the same number of elements by default and the same element type. I'll just complete this function by returning the array which stores the result of A plus B. So once I've added this function, I'll just save the file and go into the Julia REPL. Now I'm going to use Revise, which is a package to help interactively explore your code. So I'm going to show you how to install this, just in case you don't have it already. So once you're in the REPL, you want to press the close square bracket key, which will drop you into the package management mode of the REPL. And by default, you should see this 1.11 version, which is the version of Julia that you have installed. This is your global environment. You can also see on the bottom left hand side of the screen there is a Julia version which says the same version. If you click this you can select an environment. Since revise is a package that you're likely to use a lot, I'll put this in the global environment for now. So in order to add the package you simply type add a space and then type in the name of your package, in this case revise. As you can see I've already added revise so there was nothing that I needed to do here. To go back to the main Julia REPL just press backspace and then to clear the screen, we will use Control L. Now that we have Revise installed, let's bring it into the REPL. So the only command we're going to need from this package is the one that's called include with a T on the end. And here we're just going to give it a path to the file that we're working with, which in this case is just main.jl. This command will look for any changes in our file and automatically load it into the REPL. So if we change the name of our function, the new function name should immediately be available in the terminal. Let's create an array of random numbers with, let's say, 100 elements. By default, this will print out to the terminal. We'll do the same for a second array B, but this time we'll use a semicolon to suppress the output. And again, I'll just use Control L to clear the screen. So now we have two arrays, which are both vectors of floating point numbers. So let's test our function and see that it works. And you can see here, we have the expected result. But since this video is about benchmarking, let's not focus on what the algorithm does, but instead focus on how we can time this algorithm. So the most straightforward way to do this in Julia is use the at time macro. So what we do is put at time on the front of the function call that we want to measure the time taken to execute. So if we time our function, you can see that it only took a very small amount of time. We also get some extra information about memory allocations, and we'll talk more about this later on in the series. But one thing to know about the at time macro is that it can be very useful for timing something that takes on the order of a few seconds or a few minutes, but the at time macro is not very accurate as the amount of time taken to execute your function decreases. Another problem with the at time macro is it can include compilation time as well, and so it can give you a distorted view of how long your function actually takes to execute. So I'll just clear the REPL with Control L, so now let's try and re-trigger compilation for a different input type. So this time I'm going to create an array of random integers, again with 100 elements, and the same for B. Now if we call at time on our vector add function with these new inputs, 
You can see that the time taken to execute was increased massively from before, and also we get much more information here. You can see that the number of memory allocations and the memory used was much higher than previously, and also the at time macro reports that 99.84% of this execution time was actually doing compilation instead. If we run this macro again, you can see that the compilation time goes away, and this doesn't happen the second time. If we run this benchmark again, you see that it takes around 5 microseconds to complete. We can repeat this timing to get a different answer, and you can see that each time I run this command, we'll get a different time for it. So using the at time macro only gives you a sense of how long your function takes, but it's not an accurate measure. And so if we want to take an accurate measure, we'll have to do a lot of repeats. Instead of writing this code every time, there is a very useful package called Benchmark Tools, which lets you do this. Benchmark Tools is one of the standard packages within Julia, and it's widely used throughout the community. In this video, we'll go through how to use this package effectively, but if you really want to understand how it works, I'd suggest you go down to the documentation and the readme to have a look at what it does. And in this video, and for the rest of this course, we'll be using Benchmark Tools to accurately measure the performance of our code. So now we're back in VS Code, let's open up the package environment in the REPL by using the close square bracket key. Again, we're still in our global environment, and because Benchmark Tools is so widely used, I'm going to just add it into our global environment. So once you've typed add benchmark tools and pressed enter, this will make the package available. In my version, I already have it installed, so no changes were made. Again, we press backspace to go to the normal Julia REPL, and we can bring in benchmark tools by typing it into the REPL. So now that we have benchmark tools installed and loaded, we have access to a different macro. So instead of using at time, we're going to use at B time, and B here stands for benchmark. If we press enter, you can see that this takes a lot longer to actually come up with a result. This is because at B time measures your code multiple times. So now let's use a different macro to have a look at some more detailed information about what happened during this benchmark. So instead of at B time, we use the macro at benchmark. And this gives you a lot of detailed information about what happened during the execution of your function. You can see that many thousands of examples were taken, and this is a dynamic number based on how long your function takes to run. If your function takes many seconds to trial, then it will probably only do a couple of samples, whereas if it takes only a few nanoseconds to run, then it will take many more samples. This benchmark is very useful because it gives you accurate statistics about the runtime of your function. What you can notice immediately is that the runtime of this function spans several orders of magnitude. You can see that the minimum time taken to execute was 36 nanoseconds, whereas the maximum time taken to execute was around 11 microseconds. In a later video, we'll talk about why this has such inconsistent performance. One thing that you should notice that is if you use the at B time macro, you're not getting a very accurate view of this function. It's only returning the minimum time taken to execute your function, and you lose out on a lot of the nuance of how this function actually performs, especially if you're going to be calling this function many, many times. A more accurate measure for this function, if you were going to be calling it within a for loop, would be the mean time taken which you can see is around 10 times slower than the minimum time. What's also very useful to see is the distribution of results plotted as a histogram. And to save room, this is plotted as the log frequency by the time. And so this will span from 36 nanoseconds all the way up to 3 microseconds. And this histogram tells an interesting story. You can see that our function mostly executes quite quickly within a few hundred nanoseconds. But with some frequency, this function takes much longer to execute, on the order of a few microseconds instead. Again, we'll talk about why this happens in a later video, but a clue as to what's happening here is already given on screen with these metrics of GC. And here, GC stands for garbage collection, and we'll talk about this in much more detail later on in the course. What's also very useful about this macro is that it doesn't only give you an estimate of the time taken, but also the resources used, in this case, memory resources. Executing this function used up around one kilobyte of memory and also made some allocations. We'll talk about what allocations are later on in the course. The way that we've used benchmark here isn't the most accurate way of using the function. The syntax that I'd usually recommend for using benchmark tools is to instead interpolate your variable names into your function. And what do I mean by this? Essentially, just add in a dollar sign before your variable names. You can see in this case, the results are practically the same between the two, but in some other examples, you might be seeing spurious allocations, and that's due to not interpolating your variables here. 
One thing that you should notice throughout this entire process is that the results that we got ranged a huge amount. We ran this benchmark twice and you can see that it took 36 nanoseconds in the first case, in the minimum time, and in the second case it took 26 nanoseconds. You can see that the mean time was roughly on par between the two, but when we used the at time macro we got something that was on the order of microseconds instead. So why is this timing so inconsistent? So there are a few reasons for that, and to demonstrate this I'm going to open up Windows Task Manager. So this screen is a little bit overwhelming, but I'll just draw your attention to the key points. The first point that I want you to look at is this speed variable here. And you can see at the moment it's on around 1.08 gigahertz, but this jumps around massively. If I were to stop recording this video, this would jump all the way back down to 1 gigahertz to save power. This happens on a lot of modern chips and your CPU will dynamically increase its speed and decrease its speed depending on its current workload. At the moment you can see that the workload is fairly high and consistent and that's just because I'm recording this video. Another factor that affects these modern chips is a heterogeneous design. So let's head over to the spec sheet for my CPU and show you what I mean. So here I'm just on the Intel website looking at the spec sheet and you can see that I'm running this on my laptop and this is a mobile CPU platform. Most modern processors have multiple CPU cores to allow them to better handle multitasking. On my CPU I have 24 cores and this means in theory that my machine can do 24 things in parallel. But powering multiple CPU cores in a single chip requires a lot more power and so more modern chips tend to favor approach where you have two different types of cores. One of these types of cores is a traditional performance core which is able to run at the max speed of the processor and handle a variety of complex tasks. The other type of cores that you'll see are efficiency cores, and these usually run at a much lower speed and are not as capable as the performance cores in terms of throughput. But on this CPU, there are many efficiency cores for tasks that aren't as high priority. Higher priority tasks tend to be put on the performance cores to benefit from the extra processing power. The reason why I'm telling you about this is because if you're running multiple programs at the same time, this might interfere with your benchmark. If you're on a lower power setting on your laptop, it can also cause your programs to be run on the efficiency cores rather than on the performance cores. And if this happens, you might get a distorted view of how long your function actually takes to run because it's using a core which has a much lower clock speed than you would expect. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the processor on your machine and understand the implications, especially when you're doing benchmarking. You can also see that the max frequency of my CPU is around 5.4 gigahertz, whereas the performance that we saw was around 4.1 gigahertz. And that's because your clock speed will change based on how much power your chip is drawing. If you're running lots of things at the same time and using all of your cores, your chip will draw more power and therefore it will produce more heat and your CPU core will reduce its clock speed to reduce the amount of heat that's coming out so that your fans can actually dissipate it and your chip doesn't melt. And so this is something that you need to be a bit aware of when you're benchmarking. It's like, what else am I doing at the same time? One note, if you're on a laptop, you might want to check your laptop's power management settings to see whether you're on a power saver or balance mode when you're doing your benchmarking, as this can severely affect how long your benchmark takes to run. So now that we know a little bit more about the caveats when you're performing benchmarking, let's use this new technique to compare the performance between two different algorithms, and we'll hop straight back into VS Code. So now what I'm going to do is write a new function that performs the same task, but hopefully has a much more consistent performance. And so the way I'm going to modify this function is by making it a mutating function. So instead of allocating an array here, C, to hold the results, instead I'll expect the caller to pass in this memory. And so here I've added the exclamation mark to denote that the first argument gets mutated. We'll talk more about why you would actually do this later on in the course, but the main reason is that if you're reusing this function many, many times, you only have to allocate the memory for it once, and then reuse that memory every time you call that function later on. And let's have a look at the difference this makes in the performance. So we'll run the benchmark on the old code, and then run the benchmark on the new code, but for that we need to pre-allocate the memory before we run the benchmark. So now we'll call our new function and run the benchmark. And you can see this benchmark executed a lot quicker than the old one. You can see that the time taken now is only around 10 nanoseconds when compared to the 28 nanoseconds from before. You can also see that the range of values measured is much, much smaller. The minimum time was 10 nanoseconds and the maximum time was 24 nanoseconds. 
And so this is really a massive improvement in the consistency of our benchmark. Even though the minimum time is only three times faster by removing that allocation, the mean time taken to execute our function was actually 35 times faster. And so this is why it's really important to actually benchmark your two functions, because even though the best time that you measure for each might be fairly similar, the effect of this on your code might be proportional to the mean time, not the minimum time. And this is why you need to properly benchmark your functions so that you can accurately understand the statistics of your performance, because this is much more indicative of how your function will actually perform. And that's where I want to end today's video. Over the next few videos, we'll learn a few optimization techniques that will help to improve the performance of our code, and we'll verify these performance improvements using the benchmarking techniques that we learned within this video.